Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Baker with Jazz Guitar Today, and we're here with one of my best guitar friends in the whole wide world, Curtis Jones. And actually, Kim, I know you're linking, you're you're lingering back there somewhere. Hey Kim, there. Kim, yeah. Kim, Kim Jones is there as well. And uh, just to give people a little background for those people around the world that might not know who you are, shame on them. Curtis is um, is a Georgia uh, guitar player. Uh, it would be unfair to call him a bluegrass guitar player or a jazz guitar player or any particular genre because he crosses all kinds of genres. His love of gypsy jazz, he's a huge Django guy. And uh, his love of Tony Rice, uh, he's a huge bluegrass guy, obviously. It's kind of come together um, with his own thing. And uh, and he, he calls it Mountain Gypsy Music. Mountain Gypsy Music. Mountain Gypsy Music. And, um, and so it's it's a it's a combination, and this is my words, not yours. I'm, I'm gonna let you describe it after I sort of it's a combination of of the uh, the gypsy music of uh, you know from Django Reinhardt, if you will, and and the mountain music of East Tennessee and North Georgia and North Carolina combined together so is that a fair assessment yeah that's real close there's uh definitely a spanish flamenco element that's added in as well but um but uh very heavy in uh in appalachian roots uh roots music in general from flamenco to gypsy jazz uh django style and uh and then a good deal of bluegrass influence mountain music well for people that don't know Kim and um, and Curtis play sometimes three and four gigs a day. They are the workingest musicians that I know. We love like, it anywhere on the planet. I mean, you're you're routinely playing two gigs a day, and yeah, pretty regular. Yeah, one almost one almost every day. I mm -hmm. think Kim told me you had like 350 bookings for next year already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just a lot of bookings um so these guys are very very popular um so let's talk about what is mountain what is mountain gypsy music and if you want to grab a guitar and and um give us some kind of a demonstration of what you're doing we'll, we'll we'd love to see what's up okay yeah i happen to have a few behind me and and yeah, about 20 of them here in the living room well so. i know you own about 500 guitars so. yeah i do it's, it's yeah. pretty crazy yeah uh well so where it started is back in the mid 80s when i got to do a little touring and playing with larry rice who is tony rice's older brother and uh being at the time i was just pretty much strictly a bluegrass flat picker um well i went down and uh was touring with larry and i got to meet tony uh, for the first time and spend a little time with Tony. And uh, Tony told me a couple of things that day that really stuck with me. And the first being that after I played for him, I played exactly or as close as I could get to Tony. I mean, incredible. But uh, but I was playing at that time as no, close as I could get it to the way he sounded. And uh, Tony looked me in the eye and said, uh, son, I was a kid. He said, son, uh, that is really impressive. You have figured that out without, you know, any instruction. You just kind of used your ear to figure out what I'm doing. And uh, he said, it's very impressive, but it would impress me more to hear you play this tune the way you play it. I would rather hear Curtis Jones play it. I've already heard myself play it. And that really stuck with me. And he told me in that same day that um, the most important thing an artist can do or be is original. It's number one. And he said, um, try to find your own voice on your instrument with whatever you're doing. Try to find your own way of doing things and create something new and fresh for people to hear. And uh, that really stuck with me. So I left there on that trip to Florida uh, with in mind that I really wanted to search and try to create my own style of music and my own way of doing things. So, so what led me to Mountain Gypsy music was, was that was the start of it for sure. And then uh, a few years later, I was playing bluegrass and touring over in Europe with a band called Bluegrass Etc., who were a great group of guys, uh, great musicians, and, uh, but they were playing pretty much straight ahead bluegrass. While we were over there, me and the banjo player, who had a very eclectic taste in music as well, 
uh, went out to a, a tavern and heard flamenco music for the first time. So when I heard these uh, flamenco players just basically jamming in a, in a tavern, uh, it really, I mean, just floored me. I was amazed. There was a couple of small guitar players, young kids, probably 11 to 12, just wearing these guitars out. I mean, just absolutely playing the strings off of them. So I knew there was something, there was some kind of gypsy Spanish in my blood somewhere because that music literally brought me to tears. I mean, I was, I remember sitting in the tavern and Dennis looked at me, who was the banjo player and and he kind of looked weird, like, why are you crying? And I mean, I literally had tears rolling down my face. Uh, the music was just overwhelmingly passionate. And just the way they were playing and accommodating each other was I had never heard anything quite like that. You know, you get similar to that in bluegrass jams and, and you meet all these guys and you kind of have a general language, you come together. Um, but I had never seen it to that level of technique before. So it really, really set with me. So I came home from that trip and, and thought, uh, I've got to add elements of that music into my flat picking. So I started uh, just kind of messing with that. And then I discovered Django Reinhardt and that was the nail in the coffin. Uh, when, when I heard him play, I'm like, you know, that is just the most incredible guitar music I've ever heard. And still is to this day, Django's my favorite musician. But, I, but again, I didn't want to copy Django. So one of the problems I have with gypsy jazz and bluegrass in general is most guitar players try to sound just like Tony Rice. They're, they're trying to recreate what Tony has already done. Same way with Django. You know, all the Django guys, uh, great players, all of them, but they don't really search for what made Django special. And what made Django special was his ability to be completely original, to take a tune like Autumn Leaves or some of the standards, uh, See You in My Dreams, and really make it his own music. I mean, that's the one thing about Django. When you hear his music, even though other composers compose the music, it sounds like Django's music. So it sounds, I mean, a million times I've heard people say, um, oh, all of me, Django Reinhardt wrote that, you know, because they're so familiar with the way he plays it. It sounds like he wrote that piece of music, even though he didn't. Now, Django was a fabulous writer, but, uh, but he didn't write that piece. But everything he played, he made it his sound. And, uh, and also tone. Django had exceptional, exceptional tone. And so his sound was always developing through his years. And um, a lot of musicians, I think, kind of get off the boat there. They, they capture a sound that they think is close to Django, and then they don't really explore other avenues of, of creating tone and uh, strings, different strings and different sounds. So that, that inspired me to, to try to, even though I was playing a flat top guitar um, in bluegrass music, I was really reaching for the sound the flamenco guys got, the sound Django got on a, Mac, a McAfee guitar, and the flamenco guys, of course, playing Spanish flamenco classical stringed instruments. So I was really trying to incorporate a lot of that sound into my own flat picking. Uh, and it kind of led me down the path to say, you know, there's really not a law against me playing uh, a standard fiddle tune and instead of playing it in major, switch it to minor and do it gypsy style. There's really not any laws I'm breaking doing that. <laughs> so it didn't go over well with the purist and the traditional bluegrass guys. Trust me on that. But um, <laughs> but but it did open the door to me to find my own music, which I feel is my own music, and it is called mountain gypsy music. And it took me years to find um, the right musician to do it with. And fortunately, that right musician is my lovely wife, Kim Jones, who, who understands the vision that I'm trying to put forth with Mountain Gypsy Music. Right. So she really has uh, grasped it and she works really hard to, uh, to accommodate on the, the upright bass with what I'm trying to do on the guitar. So that's kind of a short tale of how how the thought process was. I, I thought I, that was fascinating. <laughs> it, it's it's been a it's been a cool journey for sure. 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, we're gonna we're gonna get some videos of you playing, and you know the one that you know stuck out is something you did a million years ago. You did Sweet Georgia Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, was that's got to be twenty years ago now? You probably close to yeah, twenty years ago now. And uh, you know everybody was wowed by that because of the speed and the articulation and all of these things that you did on that. And um, and it is fast. There's no doubt about it. And it's clean and it's articulate. But that was you twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, as we all grow and do different things, but I know that's a, a, has that got a million hits on it already or something. It, it actually is right at a million, a million yeah, hits. A million yeah. hits, yeah. So people that want to see Curtis twenty years ago can see uh, Curtis Jones, Sweet Georgia Brown, and you'll see the the um, the beginning of what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. That was the very beginning. Yeah, the beginning of it, because you know that's you know. Um, but you know, I was uh, we were playing. A, you and I shared a, a show a couple of years ago up in Dahlonega, Georgia. That was their jazz festival or jazz something like that. And I had my band and you had your band up there. And the other guitar player with me is uh, Bill Hart, who was the teacher uh, and head of the guitar department at AIM, which is the Atlanta Institute of Music. And for like thirty years, he was there, and he's a phenomenal, phenomenal player. And um, and he heard you guys play and he and he wanted to take lessons from you. <laughs> well, I'm, well, I'm flattered for sure. So, you know, uh the people really people in in the jazz world, what's what's really interesting is that, you know, I know you well enough because we know each other personally. I know you well enough to know that, you know, when you're like a dog with a bone, man. If you decide you're gonna do something, I mean, you just jump in whole hog and 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 get it get it done but meanwhile while we got you on camera why don't you grab a guitar okay and uh it could be you know you could be a couple of different ones and just show a little bit of what we're talking about like what what the traditional bluegrass would look like and then what look at that guitar that thing that thing is awesome i don't i've said that oh this is uh this is an amazing instrument they made by a dear friend of mine uh named hammer hammerson mm -hmm. and um so this is an 18 and a half inch arch top Wow. And uh, and this guitar really is kind of my go-to if I'm wanting to mix the flat picking with the gypsy sound. So that's 18 and a half inches. Huh? Let's 18 and a half inches. Let me check out the back of it. Let me see what. And the it, yeah, just about. absolutely beautiful. So is that mahogany? Is that what that is? It's um. Do you remember the what the back and sides of this is called? It's um. He's from Romania, so he used oh. mostly Romanian woods. All right. It's got a cedar top. I do know that. And look and, at the uh, look there's at the, a, uh, the the pick guard is really really awesome. Yeah, he handmade out of the same piece of wood the tailpiece and the pick guard. That's so beautiful. If you can see that, Asian ivory and eb yeah, ebony I, I is heard, the pick yeah. guard and Gorgeous. the tailpiece. Well, make some noise on it, man. Okay. Yeah. Let me just get it. <laughs> you realize that the tone of the guitar coming through zoom is leaves a lot to be desired to be desired oh yeah absolutely all right so um so yeah so just uh kind of one of the things we try to approach is uh always like i say maintaining the the mountain gypsy sound all right so i'll do nuage which is one of my favorite django pieces okay. so when i set out to to do this tune I, of course like most players that uh are into django and and all these players they kind of learn it as close as you can to the way the master played it and then and then uh taking tony's advice into hand i said really i want to try to make this tune sound like something i wrote <laughs> You know, even though I give great honor to Django, it's one of my favorite pieces of guitar music ever. And uh, nobody will ever touch Django's version of it. Uh, but this is kind of my my Mountain Gypsy version that I came up with. I'll All just right. do you a quick sampling of it. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> so you can uh so anybody familiar with uh with uh bluegrass guitar there is a few statements in there that i throw in there right such as uh, a very common uh tony rice top uh lick that he does <laughs> So it's basically out of D minor thinking, but uh, being that this tune's in F, you know, it, it it's a relative major minor. So I like adding those little bluegrass phrases and the the right hand technique of bluegrass mixed in with the jazz right. technique. Right. Yeah, and obviously you didn't warm up or anything like that. You just picked up that 18 and a half inch beast and started playing. Yeah, I'll tell you, this thing is a handful. <laughs> <laughs> and then the 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 action is is really low. It's not real low, but it's it's fairly low on it. But the string spacing on this guitar yeah. definitely requires a little bit of getting used to. It's a little yeah. bit wider. Yeah, no, I, I can I can appreciate that. Well, that's very, very cool. So this is Bob Baker with Curtis Jones saying, hey, man, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thank you. Honored man. to be here. You're an inspiration. You just you are about you're as pure an artist as I know. Well, thank you. That means a lot to me. As I know. So I, I love it. And I love you. And Kim, I love you, too. And we'll catch you guys later on down the road. Thank you so we, much. Kurt. We love you, brother. All right. See you, man. Uh, thanks bye -bye. for all you do, bye, man. Kim. Thanks, man. Bye bye. Bye bye.